And today we're going to talk about water and Jesus and being servants and maybe being servant-hearted when it comes to references of water through the Word. So I think that's pretty cool, given how over the past few weeks we've been talking about pointing outward and facing outward and what God has for us to do as work in His kingdom, right? So more equipping on that. But before all that, you know, I like to start with a bit of a story. So there was this guy called Donnie went to visit his 90-year-old uncle um, somewhere near Greytown. I know it's such a big coincidence. (laughs) After spending the night, his uncle prepared breakfast for him consisting of eggs and bacon. And when he sat down, he noticed like there was this film-like substance on the plate. And so he said to his uncle, uncle, are these plates clean? And his uncle replied, Those plates are as clean as cold water can get them. So just finish your meal. So he ate the meal, and his uncle prepared some burgers for lunch, which was quite lacquer. And when he sat down to eat his burger, he noticed like around the edge of the plate, there were those speckles and marks and streak lines. Looked like, you know, dried egg yolks. Have you ever seen that? It's like yellow concrete on a plate that you can't get off, even with a chisel. You know what I'm talking about. So he asked his uncle again, are you sure these plates are clean? And his uncle said, without even looking up from his hamburger, I told you before, these plates are as clean as cold water can get them. So don't ask me about it anymore. Later that afternoon, he headed into town. He'd had enough, and uh, he decided to get them some takeout uh, for dinner. Um, And, yeah, so they got some takeout for dinner. But his uncle's dog was growling at him viciously, and it wouldn't let him pass to get to the car. So he shouted, uncle... Your dog's growling at me, won't let me out. And without diverting his attention away from the TV, he said, Cold water, leave him alone. (laughs) And eventually you'll figure out why there was film on the plate. So be careful next time you ask for that glass of cold water, right? But, yeah, our water supply has been a bit crazy lately both from the sky, right? We have floods for a while and too much from the sky and roads and stuff getting washed away. And then it seems like for months, there's nothing and your grass is is like crispy when you walk on it (laughs) and everything's emptying and and dry. Um, And there's a couple of stories in the Bible that talk about a cup of cold water. So let me ask you this. When you Think about that this morning. What story springs to mind from the Bible about cold water? There's a few, right? I mean, you're thinking right now, sure, this or that or whatever. And let's jump into Matthew chapter 10 and verse 42. This is Jesus speaking. If anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of those little ones who is my disciple, I truly tell you that person will not lose their reward. Amen? They'll not lose their reward. And what's interesting is that throughout the Bible, there's this constant reference to the giving of water and the opportunity for you and I to serve others. Some of them are pretty extreme. (laughs) We'll jump right into one. And if you've got your sword with you on your phone or tablet or in person, we're going to go to 2 Samuel <clears throat> 2 Samuel 23, you can read the whole scripture at home, but for those of us following along on the screen, I'll bring it up here. So one time when David was living in the cave of Adullam, if that's how you say it, uh, the invading Philistines were in the valley of Rephraim, and three of the 30 top-ranking officials in the Israeli army went down at harvest time to visit him. David was in the stronghold at the time, For Philistine marauders and remorders had occupied the nearby city of Bethlehem. And David remarked just something quite simple, right? How thirsty I am for some of that good water in the city well. The well was near the city gate in Bethlehem town, by the way. So, three men broke through the Philistine ranks and drew water from the well and brought it to David. But he refused to drink it. He poured it out before the Lord. No, no. My God, he exclaimed, I cannot do it. He felt he couldn't drink the water, right? Why? This is the blood of those men who have risked their lives. 
in fetching it for me. And so I remember speaking on this scripture a few years back. It was like seven years ago. And it, it blew my mind then. But it, again, this past week, just thinking about it and reflecting on it. You think about a scripture story like this and you go, who were these guys? Like, who were these guys? I mean, for the cost of water for David, the king, I mean, it was properly serious. They've risked their lives to go and get him a drink of water off the back of something he said in passing. And so I'll bring it up quickly because it's interesting just to chat through this. Because the first guy is Jashobim. Jashobim, there he is, right? He was, according to the word, the most heroic of all of David's men. Some translations say he is known as Adino. They call him Adino. Check him there on the screen. That was the other oak I could find that looked like Jash or Adino. I had to look carefully at the tattoos to make sure there's no fluke wordo or anything like that for church this morning. So he's straight out of the 26ers gang. He's a wild O, right? Why did they call him Adino? I don't know. Exactly. Well done. <laughs> so this guy, this Jash, was in charge of two and a half thousand men in David's army, according to the scripture in, in Samuel, right? He once killed 800 men in battle, in one battle. So, like, we just blast through stuff like that. If you're in your quiet time in the morning, yeah, he killed 800, like, fantastic, right? Let's move on to the next guy. Matt and I were talking about it last night. It's like roughly every 30 seconds he took a life, and he didn't take a break for almost seven hours if you want to get to 800 in one battle. That's proper. He was a tough, tough guy. The next guy was Eleazar. Eleazar was the son of Dodo, but don't ever call, that, call him that to his face, right? So this guy stood with David in battle when the rest of Israel had fled. Look how chuffed he looks about that. He killed so many that day that his hand had to be pried from the handle of his sword. Then the Israelites retreated, but Eleazar stood his ground and struck down Philistines until his hand grew tired and froze to the sword, and the Lord brought about a great victory that day. The troops returned, but only to strip the dead. That's what that scripture says in fullness. So I want you to notice something about this guy. The word says, the rest of the army ran away. Understand how intense the battle must have been if the rest of the army ran away. It wasn't a chilled battle. He stood his ground and he fought until they had to take his hand and pry it off the sword handle. That's pretty intense, okay? The next guy was Shama. He was the son of Agi. The son of Gi, Antilesh. Yeah, he was the son of Gi. I know he looks a bit fur. <laughs> like some of us, you can point if you want around the room. He was first at the queue for the samosa table after Sunday morning service, right? So the word says this in verse 11. Next to him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Heretite. And when the Philistines banded together at the place where there was a field full of lentils, notice, Israelites' troops fled from them, but Shammah took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and struck the Philistines down, and the Lord brought about a great victory that day. He wasn't just the son of Gi, he was defending the dull lentils. <laughs> this is a Durbanite warrior, this oh, let me tell you. He stood alone in the lentil field, surrounded on all sides. Again, everyone else has fled, run away, and he defends the field and strikes down the Philistines until he got the victory. These were great warriors, right? It's not your run-of-the-mill soldiers, what, what. They were great and mighty warriors. They were David's top five. They were daring. They were dedicated. When all the others had run off, they stood firm. They were willing to fight. 
They were prepared to go to any length to please their king. If you like, they were basically the first blue light brigade, right? They were right at the front of the convoy. They were protecting David. They were seeing to his needs. They were the SEALs, the Delta Force, the captains of the special forces of that time. They weren't junior officers. So let's think about that for a moment, right? The king needs water. He needs a drink. We're too important for that little task. We're the captains. No. But if you think about it, captains don't do the work, right? They send one of their two and a half thousand men, if you're Jash, to go and do the work for you, right? Yet at the mere hint of David wanting a drink of water from that well, bang, the lads are up. They're running, they're breaking through enemy lines just to go get a drink of water for David. It's amazing. I had to check myself this week. I was sharing with myself and Alex earlier. It's, it's been a properly tough <laughs> week. <laughs> and when I maybe didn't feel like spending a heap of time on this preach today, like maybe Donnie should have picked someone else. I phoned Marcel at quarter past eight and said, bro, how do you feel about preaching this morning? This morning. To his credit, he was like, okay, <laughs> I'll do it. Thanks for the advance notice, but I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> and then I was confronted in preparing with guys like these guys. I had to reflect on this story and think for myself, as I hope you will today. Am I like David's men in the service of Jesus? At the most subtle hint that he drops, do I drop everything and run for him? Because when everyone else has run off and he's asking us, will we fight fiercely for what he's contending for in his kingdom? His bride, his church, the great commission that Donnie's preached so well over, over so many weeks, right? Go into all the world, even when the going is tough, even when we don't necessarily feel like it. Like Jackie encouraged us last week to go into all the Lesotho and be part of what's happening over there and not be embarrassed because there's so few of us. <laughs> that was good, Jackie. Or maybe be we'll be one of the ones that are in the heat of the battle and run off. There were many of those, right? When the king needs us most, we're hiding in the background somewhere. I hope that's not you. The David didn't say when he was asking for that drink of water, can someone please go and fetch me a drink of water from that well? It wasn't even on his radar screen that someone was going to go. He was just saying, yo, guys, imagine how lekker it would be right now if we could just be sipping on a drink of water from that sweet well in Bethlehem. And bang. <laughs> Blue lights on. Adino, Dodo's Lighty, and the Gee Boy, they're off, bro. And they're like, through the enemy lines... <laughs> Smashing out. Yeah, it was funny for me too, bro. Through enemy lines to the well, grab some water, back to the cave, and sort it, right? So I got onto Google Maps just to have a look. Like, where is this place? So it even gives you the how long it would take you by car. <laughs> so Adullam is down there uh, in the bottom left. It's now showing as Adullam Grove Nature Reserve. But the cave of David is in that reserve. And then you see Bethlehem along that red line. And the Bible says that trip, not the 50-kilometer road trip in blue around the top, but that trip in red in one direction is about 13 miles. You know, you read it in the Word like, okay, cool, and you carry on. It's 13 miles. That is 20.9 kilometers, almost precisely a half marathon. Each way. So they traveled a marathon's distance to break through enemy lines, the three fighting warriors, to get a glass of water and bring it back to the cave so David could have. A, it's mind-blowing. 
Can you imagine the confusion of the enemy? I mean, <laughs> they were probably tracking these oaks and going like, what is happening? They were on, these, are the, these are one of the top five, two of the top, three of the top five. They're on a mission, boys. Let's follow them and let's check what's going on here. I mean, probably they were standing back a bit because the last few that tried to tackle them, you know, people's hands are to be prized from swords and lentil patches were defended. So they were probably on some, they tracked them and they went to get water and then break back out and go back to where they came from. Imagine their shock when it was a 42K marathon to get some water. So, I really believe God is calling us as this local church, City Life, Sunningdale, to some amazing things, despite the noise of what maybe we working through ourselves this year. Amen? He's been speaking through His Spirit over many, many weeks. Be encouraged. It will require every one of us that are sitting here and those that couldn't be with us today. It will require our service and dedication. Amen? Wow. That's mind-blowing for me. So I hope that we'll see the value today of being a servant to Jesus in whatever capacity may be required and whenever it may be asked of us. And it's not about glory or title or position. All the glory goes to Him. Amen? All the glory goes to Jesus. It's simply about serving Him. Here's another scripture that we know well. Uh, Isaiah 40 verse 21. Those who wait on the Lord will what? Renew their strength, mount up with wings as eagles, right? What does wait mean? There's two meanings for the word wait. You'll know them well. Remain where you are until a certain time. Don't look at the screen for a moment. That's the meaning of wait we normally apply to this scripture. Those who stop and pause and wait on the Lord will renew their strength, right? There's another meaning to the word wait. It means to remain in readiness for a specific purpose. Have you been to a fine restaurant where the waiter waits on you? If we wait on the Lord, we remain in readiness for His purpose that if he whispers, man, it would be nice to have a glass of boom and we're gone to go and get it. That's a different kind of waiting to pausing, right? So if you read it in the second context for a moment, those who remain in readiness for a certain purpose or to do the Lord's willing to do his work and to do his bidding shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow. These three legends in the Bible waited on who? David. They waited on David. They stood ready, waiting to do his bidding, even to respond to subtle hints. Do they sound weak to you when we describe them? Do they sound fragile, struggling through life? Or do they maybe sound a little bit more like Isaiah 40 when you read it in its fullness? Run and not grow weary. 21 Ks in each direction. Walk and not grow faint. Defend the lentil patch when everyone else has run off, right? So do we have to wait, pause, before we have strength? Or do we gain strength as we wait in readiness to serve the Lord and do His work and are fully equipped and empowered by His Spirit to be out there where God's placed us, making a difference in the lives of the communities, we get to serve, wait, serve, wait on the Lord. And these guys were waiters, they were servants, they were examples to all of us because they were strong, and they were strong because of their waiting, according to Isaiah 40. The sad truth, I think, of the world today is we don't really want to do a lot of stuff unless we're paid to do it or made to do it, like forced to do it. And in God's kingdom, it's not about grudging. It's not about compulsion. It's about, man, I want to, right? I want to, whether it's a context of giving, of cash or giving 
time, giving, relationship, giving, whatever it is, I choose to. What's in it for me? Does it fit into my plans? Do I have the strength and the energy for it? Does it fit into my schedule? Do I have time for it? Maybe if I get some time, I'll try and fit it in. I can't really do the morning slot. I'm not a morning person. Do you know how many nights I've already had to be out this week? It's getting quiet in here. No amens for the rest of this, okay? (laughs) For some folks, it's the limelight. I need to be out there in front, appearing when there's a parade, but not necessarily in battle. That's not the king's men. They were the first ones into the battle to go and crash through. What if consequences weren't just inconvenient? Because I think we shy away from work as his servants right now because largely of inconvenience. For them, it wasn't just inconvenience. They were risking their lives like pastors and Christians do in various places around this planet just to live a Christian life or declare, I am a child of God. And we aren't all called to the same gifts we called to his service, right? Yo, I've still got this on the screen. Sorry for the people online. I'm controlling what you're seeing. (laughs) Ephesians 4, verse 11 to 12. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, right? All the different gifts. For what? To equip his people. For what? For works of service. How many times has Donnie spoken to us from this particular passage about Jesus equipping us for this purpose, for works of service? Are you God's people? Am I God's people this morning? Yes. Amen? We'd say that. Yes. I am. Great. You were called to? Works of service. And equipping others for? Works of service. And I think God is looking for mighty men and women like the ones we've seen this morning who won't just respond to his demands but respond to his desires because he's not going to demand stuff of us. He's going to tell us what he desires of us and for us and we get to choose whether we respond to that or not. What an encouraging word, Mike. Thank you so much. So imagine if there was no command needed, right? If we reflect on this passage, it's literally itching, 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 itching. I can't wait for him to ask us for water. Let's go. Boom. That's a very different way of being standing in readiness to to go, right? To fetch a cup of cold water. So maybe you say like me at the end of a really long week or month, like February was a long year for me. Um, or year, or season, or whatever you're facing, right? Mike, I would really love to give, but I feel an emptiness. I genuinely feel like there's nothing left in my tank to give. For some of us, that might be you this morning. I felt like that this past week, and I was reminded of this next scripture. 1 Kings 17. Here's the widow in Zarephath. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I may have a drink? And as she was going to get it, he called and please bring me a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar, a little oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home to make my final meal that we may eat it. For my son and I, we may eat it and die. And Elijah said what to her? He said, don't be afraid. Go home as you have said. But first, make a small loaf for me and what you ha- of what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for you and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. The jar of flour will not be used up. The jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. So you know the story. She goes away. She prepares this final meal, and for the rest of time, until the rains fall again, what happens? The oil and the jar don't run dry. So I don't know where you're at this morning. For some of us, as I said, it may be a place of like genuinely feeling 
empty this morning. I hear God crying out through that scripture, I'll take the very last of whatever you have to give me. And when you give it to me, you will not run dry. In this story, there's been an incredible drought in the land. If you go and read it, three and a half years, solid drought. The widow and her son literally preparing to die. Maybe you've been in that place at some time. You've gone to open those cupboard doors or the fridge and there's nothing. Elijah sees her gathering sticks and he says, please would you give me what? A cup of water. Again. Any of you have friends in Verulam? You haven't had water for? Weeks. Months. What's precious when there's nothing? When you don't have water, what's precious? This is absolutely precious. It seems meaningless when we read the scripture. Well, a cup of water. No, they were in a drought. They were desperate for this. And he asked her, may I have some water? When he asked her for bread, think about the context of no water. They're speaking in South Africa about the drought and the heat and for how long it's been going on and the consequences on the current crops that are in the ground, right? There's food security food security concerns right now because of that situation here. It hasn't been going on for three and a half years. We've had a few weeks of it. Three and a half years. She, the widow here is literally being asked to give everything. Everything. To who? To a stranger. Out of the very last desperation of where she was at, she was willing to to serve. That's what I read here. And it wasn't from a place of abundance. She didn't say, sorry, I haven't been to the shops yet. I don't have anything for you. A moment ago, the mighty men also weren't serving the king from a place of abundance. They had to go and fight for it. Sometimes we have to do that to contend for what the king desired, not what he commanded. In this story, the window, the widow, not the window, shame, that's something else. The widow <laughs> wasn't giving from her overflow, right? She wasn't giving from her abundance. She wasn't be giving, be giving because her purse was overflowing with cash that week. The meal she was preparing was literally the last meal before she says it, my son and I can go and die. Wow. For me, this week, I'll be honest. I didn't feel I had a lot left to give. Are we willing to serve Jesus from our emptiness? Or only when there's abundance and only when there's no fight involved? That's the challenge, right? What about tiredness? Ooh-wee. Tiredness, tiredness, tiredness. Listen to this one. Genesis 24. Before he, that's Abraham's servant, had finished praying. What was the servant doing? Praying. Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor. She went down to the spring. She filled her jar and she came up again. And the Servant hurried to meet her and said, please give me a little water from your jar. What does she say? Immediately, drink, my Lord. She said, quickly, lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. Wow. And after she'd given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too. Until they have had enough to drink. <laughs> So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well to draw more water and drew enough for all of his camels. And so the servant's prayers were answered and he receives the sign, if you know the scripture that he was looking for. And he goes from here and he asks Rebecca's father for her hand in marriage for his master's son. And we skip past all this and we go, aww. Cute story. <laughs> but there's really two incredible servants in this story, right? The first one, 
is this guy here. It's Abraham's servant. At Abraham's request, Father Abraham, he traveled 500 miles, according to the word. 500, I would walk 500 miles, right? It's a scriptural song, that one. This guy here, Abraham's servant, he walked 500 miles to do what? To look for a wife for Isaac. He basically, if you go and check it out, he took a walk from Durban to Kimberley. Through the desert. Have you been to Kimberley? It's like a desert, right? It's a northern free state. It says he was a stranger in that land. Have you been to the northern free state? You will feel like a stranger in your own country in the northern free state, right? And he's literally, he's tired after his journey. He's thirsty. His camels are thirsty, but he's on a mission. He's there to find Isaac, a wife. And you know what I love about this guy? He's devoted. He's obedient. He trusts God. The scripture started with what? He was praying. What was he saying? Lord, I really don't need this. After walking 500 miles for this to be a long search, I don't need that. Please, can you just let it be the one who comes to help me with water. But most of all, he's humble. You know how we know this? What's his name? You won't find his name. Go and read it. His name is, and he even introduces himself like this. Drum roll, please. (laughs) I am Abraham's servant. My master Abraham has sent me. Clearly, he loves Abraham. Clearly, he's relying on God because he's prayed the moment before he's met Rebecca. And clearly, God shows him at the well, Rebecca is the one. And then there's Rebecca, right? With a cup of cold water. Actually, It wasn't just a cup. This was the end of a long day for her. She's done a lot of work already by this point. She's at the well drawing the water for the family. We spoke about tiredness at the beginning of this point. She's bringing buckets of water at high speed. She's probably wanting to get home. He's a stranger, weird thing already to help a stranger. He's not just a stranger, but he's a foreigner. He's from Durban in the northern free state. And I love the immediacy of her response, because if you read that scripture again, it talks about this. It says, if I can now get it back up because I've I've done the wrong thing. Can you bring it up for us there? Sorry. I'll read it anyway. It says... There we go. Quickly. Drink, my Lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar of her hands. But it doesn't stop there. The stranger doesn't have to ask. She recognizes the need. And after giving him a drink, she says, I'll go draw water for your camels too until they've had enough to drink. And so what? Quickly. She emptied her jar into the trough and she ran to draw more water and drew enough for his camel. So I love that. Quickly, and she (laughs) ran. And I don't know if you've ever met a camel. They're not popular here and along our coastline, right? Camels drink a little bit of water. I looked it up. In America, they talk about gallons. That's about four liters-ish to a gallon, right? It says, a thirsty camel can drink 20 to 25 gallons of water each. How thirsty are your camels after a 500-mile walk? So let's go with 20 gallons on the low side. 10 camels. I don't know how many camels. That's 760 liters of water. If you've got a 5-liter bucket, that's 150 buckets out of the well. 
that she ran quickly to sort out. Maybe it wasn't 10 camels. Maybe it was five. I don't know. It's still 75 buckets running. <laughs> Can I have a drink? She was more than willing, more than willing to help a foreign stranger without him asking for water for his camels. Perhaps that's you today. You're feeling tired. You're feeling weary. You're feeling run down. You're like, seriously, Donnie, energy to build his church. Like, I don't know if I have energy for the work week. Rebecca was weary and tired, but she was willing to work over time for a complete stranger. A back-breaking, difficult, laborious task. What I love about this is that through her actions, her world and her destiny was about to change forever. Because why? When she met this dude, who we don't know what his name is, because he's a humble servant. She didn't know who he was or what he was doing there, right? But in that moment, no incentive to help him, not needing a desire to serve a stranger, even in her weary state, she takes a step that results in water being drawn out of a well and her meeting her husband, Isaac. And by the way, through her actions... That results in her being drafted in to the direct line and direct genealogy of Jesus. There's Isaac up at the top, just below Abraham in Abraham's line, and Rebecca becomes his wife. What is God saying? What is God saying to us through this this morning? He's saying to me, through your willingness to serve, even in your tiredness, I can change your destiny forever. Forever. You say, Mike, you don't know what I've been through. We don't know what Rebecca's been through up until this moment in time. Guess what? There are countless stories in the Bible that confirm this point. Your past is a very poor predictor of your future. We go, you don't know what I've been through up until this moment. He's saying, you don't know what's about to happen. I've been studying Esther for the past few weeks. W what a mind-blowing story. Go and read it again. It's eight chapters. It's not a long read. Wow. There's an orphan girl with her uncle who becomes queen and saves a whole nation. At the moment, she was orphaned and taken into a harem. The story didn't look great. God had a plan that didn't rely on her looking back on her past to that moment, but look forward to the destiny that he had for her. Amen? You gone quiet. So back to this passage, Abraham's servant trusted God. Rebecca trusted God. Both were willing to serve, and bang, Jesus' lineage was established forever. I love that. Through a willingness to serve, a willingness to serve, Rebecca trusted God and a couple camel troughs were filled and her destiny was changed. I love that. We don't have all the time we need now, so I'm going to end with this. But in John chapter 4, there's a story of Jesus at the well. You know, at well, oh, well. <laughs> Jesus and the Samaritan woman, right? Donnie's also touched on the story recently. Jesus asked her for what? A drink. She was shocked. By him even speaking to her. And he gave her what? Living water. Told her about her life, and she became the very first evangelist that we have record of in the Bible, right? Running back to town and sharing with whoever she saw about this guy at the well that told her the story of her life. Notice this. Jesus asked her for water. What does he give her in return for her generosity? Overwhelmingly, abundantly in return. Whatever we're offering Jesus in the fight, in the famine, in our tiredness, 
and our emptiness and our foreignness, if you're a Samaritan woman speaking to a Jew wish man, over abundant return on investment of whatever you're willing to invest in what he's doing. Such an encouragement this morning. So we started with this scripture earlier today. If anyone has even a cup of cold water or gives one of a cup of gives even a cup sure a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, I truly tell you that person will not lose their reward. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, where did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit and help you? And the king will reply, truly what? I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters, you've done it for me. I don't know about you this morning, but I really desire to serve our king. Amen? Even in emptiness, even in tiredness, even in the fight, like David's men, ready to do his bidding at the smallest, tiniest hint, even in absolute hopelessness, like the widow in the famine, and even when you're tired and worn out, and a complete stranger comes and asks you and I for help, like Rebecca at the well. Jesus reminds us this morning, he's offering you and I way more in return. Way more in return. Building the bride of Christ, fulfilling the Great Commission, like Abraham's nameless, humble servant. He's asking us, will you go and walk that 500 miles? Or run the marathon into Bethlehem? Without the need for glory, without the need for recognition, without the need for our names to be noted in history for all time. I'm excited about this. Because it says, I don't have to be perfect, I don't have to be strong, I don't have to be in a place of abundance to be useful. Every one of us sitting here today is going through something. He's saying, respond despite that situation. Amen? Can we pray into that together?